Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to one of our midday keynotes on this first day of the fourth Library 2.0 conference. Phil Bradley is here. Welcome, Phil. Hi, everyone. Really delighted to have you here. Thanks so much to our conference sponsors and supporters. Big special thanks to Dr. Sandra Hirsch, the conference co-chair, and her School of Information at San Jose State University. They are the founding sponsors of the conference. Lovely to have Rutgers helping this year with CISL. Followed, of course, Library Journal, Blackboard Collaborate, Wilson Consulting, Wilma, and Counting Options. And this is a Learning Revolution project. Please visit us at learningrevolution.com to see the variety of learning events that we hold. Those of you participating live get a chance now to indicate where you are in the world. Click to the left of the map on the star icon. You typically have to click that twice. You can click on the map. Nice. Looks like we've got some geographic variety. Feel free to put in the chat. Feel free to put in the chat the time, temperature, where you are. Waking up in New Zealand. Looks like I had a little audio lag. You're probably hearing me sound like a chipmunk. Oh, Jenny. Nice. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Phil. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good lunchtime, or as it is in my case, good evening. Um, I'm with you from just outside of London this evening, and it's about 8 o'clock in the evening over here. Uh, so my title, Alternative Search Engines, Why Google Simply Isn't Enough. Um, nice introduction from Walt. Thanks for that question about uh, we, we know um, that Google isn't enough. Um, but everybody else seems to be quite happy with it. So that's one of the questions that I really want to look at uh, this evening, is um, why we simply cannot just use Google for all of the issues and the requirements that we've got. I want to look at a few other search engines as well to give you some, obviously, some alternatives to what's available. And I want to finish by looking at where I think search is going to be moving to into the future. Now, if you're wondering who I am, perfectly fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I am um, obviously from the UK. I'm a chartered, that's to say, a professional librarian. I'm the immediate past president of the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals, aka CELIP, which is basically very similar to the American Library Association. I wanted to be a librarian since I was about 13. I became an internet consultant in 1995. And basically what I do is stuff on the internet. I talk about the internet at conferences and exhibitions. I run a lot of training courses on different aspects of the internet, social media, um, advanced internet search, and so on. And I also write a number of books on the internet. Uh, my current um, title is Expert Internet Searching, uh, which came out last year. And I have a new book out on social media for creative libraries um, towards the end of uh, this year. But obviously, what I really want to talk about this evening is the search side. When I was a kid and I was at school, I went to see my careers teacher, as most of us do. And she said to me, what, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to become a librarian. And bless her little heart, she said, oh, is that because you like books, dear? in that rather patronizing way that I think we're all kind of familiar with. And I said, no, it's not because I like books. It's because I want the power. And there was this sort of blank look of complete 
incomprehension on her face. So I explained that if you know how to find something, that means that you are a powerful person. And I'm very firmly of the opinion that within our profession, one of the most powerful things that we can do, and indeed it's a powerful profession, is because we can find stuff. So we want to be able to find stuff from a wide variety of different places. But let's start with um, Google and answer Walt's question of, well, you know, how can we get people really to start thinking about, you know, why isn't it always just Google? Firstly, uh, when I'm running training sessions for people, I will very often say to them, what's Google for? And bless their little hearts, they will very often come back and they'll say, oh, Google, there it is, it's a search engine. Google's there to, to help us find things. And I then have to break it to them that that's not really what Google's for. Google is not a search engine. And we need to be right clear at the outset, that is not what Google is. Google is not a search engine. Google is an advertising company. And they have chosen to make their money via search and bringing advertising to us as a result. Now, the problem that we've got with that is there's a very basic Google paradox that we've got here, is that if you go to Google and you do your search. If Google is very good at search, you get the answer that you want, you click on the link, you go off and you've got the information that you need available to you. Thank you very much, Google, that's great. End of story till you come back next time. Now, if Google is very good at search, Google doesn't make money. If Google is not very good at search, you've run your search, you haven't got exactly what you want from it, so you then have a look at some of the adverts that are there, you see an advert that really does the job for you, so you click on the advert, that's just made Google money because the advertiser will then pay Google. So the Google paradox is if it's good at search, which is what it tries to say that it's about, it doesn't make money. If it's not so good at search, it does make money. This is one of the problems that Google has increasingly got now and will have in the future. And it's a point that I'll come back to talk about a little bit later on when I talk about the fight that Google is in uh, with Facebook. And it's basically a fight for, to put it fairly, crugal, uh, to put it fairly crudely, your eyeballs. Um, both Google and Facebook need you to click on those lovely little adverts to make them lots of money. But as I say, I'll come on to that in a little bit. Next point to do with Google, one of the things that I've seen steadily happening over the last few years, and it, it's worryingly speeding up, is this reduction in search functionality. If you go back uh, a few years, we can all remember that on the Google homepage, you had a link through to the advanced search function. If you look at that page now, it no longer exists. You have to either run a search and then find the, search, the advanced search option at the bottom, or you've got to find the um, little cogwheel and then find advanced search that way. This is because Google doesn't want you to think. Google doesn't want you to search. Google wants to give you the answer that Google thinks you require. And Google will make that up based on what you've looked at previously, what your profile is, what, you've, what adverts it is that you have clicked on. And I can kind of get that. Um, it's only people like us that are interested in search. The average person out there isn't interested in searching, they're interested in finding. And Google knows that if it can find stuff for people and it can present that for people, they're going to be happier, they're going to be more likely to come back to Google and to use other Google functionality and also to keep seeing those lovely little adverts, clicking on them and making money for Google. So it's not particularly, in, oddly enough, um, 
interest in exactly, Len. Um, Google is created for the lowest denominator. It doesn't want people to think. It doesn't want people to search. Google wants people to um, have stuff. Now, there are other problems that are coming up uh, with the Google search as well. Um, I don't know how many of you that are not based in Europe have been looking at the Google um, problems that we've been having with a, a law that's called the right to be forgotten. Um, basically what this is, is that the European Courts of Justice have said that Google has to unindex a variety of different pages that it had previously indexed um, if somebody is unhappy with the um, information that's there about them. Um, this has covered a wide variety of different things. It's covered um, politicians who don't like the fact that Google has indexed their broken promises. Um, it has come from sex offenders who don't like the fact that Google has been indexing newspaper articles about them and so on. So this is a problem um, that Google has had to address. And I don't have a lot of sympathy for Google, but I do have a certain amount of sympathy on this because it's completely impossible. Um, in the first place, this is not um, getting rid of those articles. That newspaper article is still there about that person who's committed that law. It simply means that if you run a search, Google is not able to return that specific search to you. Um, but it doesn't mean that Google still hasn't got that data. If you think about different ways of running that search, you can still find the information uh, that you need. What Google is also doing is, obviously, since it's really unhappy with this, um, if uh, a newspaper article has had to be de-indexed by Google, they're tootling along to the newspaper and saying, oh, we've had to de-index that particular article of yours, which is not um, proving particularly popular with the mainstream media, as we can understand. You'll find if you do a search on the google.co.uk website, um, for what Google would regard as a name, very often you'll find at the bottom it says that some results may have been deleted. But what I've also noticed happening now is that this doesn't necessarily work for famous names as opposed to the average person in the street. And so if you do a search for my name, not necessarily me, but for Phil Bradley, uh, you won't find that link at the bottom because there are a number of famous Phil Bradleys that are out there. There's Phil Bradley the baseball star, and Lord help me, there's Phil Bradley the gay porn star, um, who also shares my name. And yes, occasionally I do get slightly strange email being sent through to me, but that's probably for a talk on another occasion. Um, so this whole thing doesn't work terribly well. Um, but nonetheless, um, what we're seeing is that governments want to control what Google is doing. And there are lots of takedown notices that people like Google are um, being served with on a fairly consistent basis. Um, there are lots of other things that Google tries to do. They gave us the a use of the hash symbol, but now that doesn't work any longer. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's inconsistent. In the UK, uh, Google offers you an in-depth articles function. I did this search um, fairly recently on Afghanistan, and Google seems to think that what I really want are in-depth articles that are dated um, 209, 211, 212, simply doesn't work at all. Um, if I'm looking at other things that Google does, this was a question that was asked of me a while ago on Twitter. Um, Google is inconsistent on the results that it gives you. Uh, you can see that in a variety of different ways. The first page of results that I got when I did the search for Yahoo uh, was giving me one set of figures. When I went on to the second page, it was giving me a completely different set of results. Um, it's been doing this basically forever. A while ago, I met Singerhall, who's um, one of the Google senior vice presidents, was in London. And I went along to a presentation that he did at Google and said, you know, how come these numbers don't work? And you can try this for yourself. Do a search for 
moon landing and you'll get one figure, do a search for moon landing minus hoax, you should get less, but actually you get more. Uh, his response to me I found quite telling. Uh, basically, he said, don't worry about the numbers. The numbers don't really mean anything. Well, unfortunately, numbers really do mean things. If you are a serious searcher, numbers are very important. Uh, we need to be able to rely on what we're getting. And he I mean, explained this to me by saying, well, first time Google does the search for you, say on moon landings, it gives you a rough figure. And then you say moon landings minus hoax. Um, Google suddenly thinks, oh, you know, this person's a bit more serious about search. I better do this properly. So it goes off and it does the search for you again. Uh, what this simply indicates to me is that there's so much pressure on Google, so much um, time that has to be spent doing all of those billions of searches that it can't do them accurately and it just goes on, you know, basic outline. But again, I, I can see the point because, you know, you're not going to look at 984 million results. You're going to look at nine results or ten results that you get on the first page. But again, there's a problem that you've got there, which I'll come back to. Image rights filtering is broken. It's a great idea from Google. Uh, you used to be able to, or you could do a search for images. Um, there's the option under the search tools. You can do a search for labeled for reuse with, for example, modification or um, commercial use or what have you. The problem that you've got there is it basically doesn't work. It's another example of the fact that Google tried something and they haven't followed through on it. So what you'll often find is that if you um, do a search, you try to find uh, um, images that are labeled free for reuse with um, Creative Commons, for example. Google basically sees if there's anything on the page that says, yes, Creative Commons, um, it, it basically says, OK, well, everything on that page is Creative Commons available to you, when quite clearly it isn't. Uh, so you can't trust Google results. This is something else, again, which is a common um, theme that comes out when I'm teaching people about Google. You can't trust it. Uh, what else has Google done? Google's closing down a lot of search options. It's really difficult to get hold of things like Google blog search, discussions and patents are changing in um, the more option. We're losing the option of being able to use different workarounds to get to what we want by simply putting it in a URL. What also I find very worrying is that Google is desperate to get us to continue to use their services because Facebook is now coming up on the rails. Um, within Facebook, you're within that lovely walled garden, and that's basically where you stay. The problem that Google has got is it doesn't really understand social media. And so it's trying to get us to do everything that it can do within that Google walled garden, only in Google's case it's not a walled garden. So it's trying to push us to use things like Chrome. Until recently, if you wanted to um, have a Google account, you had to have a Google Plus account. If you want to comment on YouTube videos, you've got to um, sign into having a, a Google account. Google is changing and reducing and limiting search. One of the things that I find most infuriating with Google is we've lost the tilde symbol or the synonym search function. And again, Google tries to say that, oh, don't worry about that because if you do a search for the word beginner, Google will come back with other words that mean the same kind of thing. And no, unfortunately, it doesn't do that any longer. Um, Google is paring back search um, whenever it can do because that's not really what it's interested in. It wants us to just use and to consume whatever Google decides to give us. There are plenty of other options and valuable things that Google no longer has and it's pairing back on all of those different elements. Because Google's not interested in search, Google is interested in advertising. And if you think of Google as an advertising company, this kind of makes a bit more sense. It's also very worrying that it's not very difficult to actually game Google. And the example that I give here is if you just search for Martin Luther King 
um, you'll come up with Martin Luther King Jr., a true historical examination. And it says underneath the truth about Martin Luther King includes historical trivia, articles, pictures, blah, blah. That looks like a good result. If you try it for yourself, you may find this result coming up higher. It might come down a little bit lower, but it should be up there um, close to the top of the results. Now, if you actually go off and have a look at that page, you'll find that uh, Martin Luther King is apparently a plagiarist. He's an embezzler. He's done a number of other unpleasant um, things. And if you dig into that site any further, and I wouldn't advise it, you find that that site has been put together by a racist white power organization. And although I have to grit my teeth when I say it, they've actually written their page and their site very well indeed because it gets a high ranking with Google. And because of the way that page rank still works within Google, if you look at the, the, the pages that link to that, you'll find out that, um, exactly, Abby, um, it's because librarians link to this that Google says, oh, lots of people link here, so we'd better give it a high result. Um, so Google can be um, gained. Another thing I find very concerning about Google, and uh, this is something that Eric Schmidt has been you know, very upfront about, um, is the fact that it's very difficult now to get access to material um, that hasn't been um, tailored or massaged for us in some way by Google and indeed some of the other major search engines. So if I do my search, my third result down is not necessarily going to be the same as your third result down. Um, if I do a search for gun control in the UK, I won't get the same results that you would in New Zealand or the United States. If I tend to spend a lot of my time looking at right-wing websites, I'll get different results to those that um, I get if I spend a lot of my time looking at left-wing uh, websites. So we end up with things like um, the filter bubbles that Ali Pariser has talked about. The third big problem that we've got uh, with data is, well, I've called it uh, just the big data problem. Um, I don't need to read out the statistics that we've got there, but basically what it means is that it's impossible for Google or indeed any other search engine that's out there to keep up to date with all of the information that's being put onto the web. We are no longer a, an internet that consumes content. We are an internet that is creating content. And we are not creating content in the traditional format that Google likes to work with. That is to say, on web pages. We're doing it on Twitter. We're doing it on Facebook. We're doing it on a variety of other social media platforms. And Google can't control. Google can't get access to those. So there's a huge amount of data that's out there that Google simply doesn't have access to. So those are a few of the issues and the problems that I have with Google. Doubtless I'll come back and talk about them a little bit later, but I did want to talk about alternatives, so I'd better move on to talk about some of those. The first option that you've got is Bing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Bing is no particular alternative as well. It's just another mesh mesh of the same concept and the same idea. I don't know if you've tried the Bing it on challenge, um, I tried it, I uh, uh, suggested that a number of other UK-based librarians tried it as well, and we basically all came up with the same result, which was, unfortunately, being Google's actually rather better at search than you are. Um, but, you know, if you want to try your basic alternative to, to Google, Bing's one place that you could look. Um, it does have a little bit of... Um, advantage, it does integrate a little bit better with things like Twitter. Um, it does do rollover for immediate play, but again, the problem with that is that gives you immediate access to um, pornographic material without actually going off to the website. So there's lots of problems with um, being, again, it's people that are creating search engines, but they don't actually understand search. They understand the computerization behind it. Um, Blecko is another option that you might want to have a look at. Um, 
um, the idea behind Blecker was it used to call itself slash the web, and you could put um, something like librarian slash image, and it would go off and find images for you. Um, Blecker was trying to reinvent itself um, by giving you information in this kind of format. And rather than scroll down, you can scroll across. Blecko is trying to see itself much more um, in a tablet format than as a traditional web-based format. Um, it's, it's a reasonable search engine. Um, the problems with Blecko is that it hasn't really been updated very much. Um, and it's um, had no real updates since mid-2013. Um, it has, however, produced um, a tablet-based based version. If you've got your iPad or other um, tablet device, have a look for Isaac, which looks very similar to the version that I've just indicated to you. My preference, if I'm looking for a direct competitor to Google, um, would be to try with DuckDuckGo. Um, it's a small operation. It doesn't have that many people on board. Um, but it does pretty much whatever you would expect it to. It's got um, images, um, video functionality, definitions, products, and so on and so forth. Um, the interface has been improved recently. Um, it does some really fun tools. You've got a variety of um, different things that you can do there. And um, Juliana, exactly, uh, you're right. They don't track you. This is one of the things that I'm particularly finding these days with search engines, is that they're much less interested in telling you how many pages they index and how big their um, indexes are, and doing this whole macho, um, my um, database is bigger than your database nonsense. What they're now pushing at is much more uh, material that's appropriate um, where, where, they, where they don't actually um, check what it is that you're doing. Um, thanks for that question, Jenny. I'll come back to it later on if I may do. Um, for the major search engines, for your absolute equivalence to Google, um, there aren't that many differences. Privacy, as I've said, is the, the big issue. Um, there is a lack of advanced search options because we're the very small minority that are interested in search. Everybody else wants to find. So the holy grail, as far as the search engine is concerned, is um, giving us the information rather than helping us find it and indicate great detail. Because people are generally satisfied with what it is that they find. Then we come to Facebook. And this is the other really big change that we're going to be seeing happening in the world of internet search in the future. Now, what Facebook is doing is taking a completely different viewpoint. Google is um, basing search concepts on things like websites. What Facebook is looking at is the importance of the individual and the individual expert. So I can go to Facebook, and I'm in the Facebook walled garden, and I can do a search for people I might know, films I might like, based on what it is that I have originally um, looked for. Um, my friends who like Cheshire Public Library, a really nice um, public library website from uh, the United States, lovely um, Facebook page, really, really interesting. Um, and so I can see that. And if you look over on the right-hand side, you can see the fact that there are lots of ways that I have of being able to filter that information that I'm finding. This is a much um, fuller viewpoint of how I can slice and dice the data that Facebook is giving me. So I can limit myself to my friends within a particular age range or where my friends happen to live. This is really important for me because it then means that I can say, um, find my friends who like restaurants in Manchester. And I'll get a list of who those people are. I know my friends. I know what they're interested in. And I'm going to be able to trust them much more than going to Google and saying, give me a list of restaurants in Manchester. Because Google's great. You know, it's going to give me that list. But which of those are really good? I've got no idea. But I can nonetheless, um, with my friends on Facebook, see what it is that individuals are saying is really useful and very good for me. What I can also do with things like Facebook is 
I can share my network with um, news curation tools like Zite, for example. And so what those tools are doing for me is it is it bringing back content for me that I'm going to be interested in. Or I can go to the tweetedtimes.com and say this is who I follow on Twitter. And the tweetedtimes.com will find me really interesting news stories based on what the people that I follow are finding for me. So we're moving away from the idea of the concept of the website and the web page being the most important thing to that of your um, friends being the people that can give you that kind of help, advice, and guidance. It's one of the reasons why I really push the idea of using Facebook um, with information professionals. We need to be on Facebook so that when somebody does a search, they can see, oh, that's my librarian. Um, from my local community college, or from my public library, or from my university. I'll take note of what it is that, that they are saying, what it is that they're talking about. So that's an area that we need to think about, because we're moving towards that idea of friends and experts rather less than the traditional, the website is the most important thing. Um, it's certainly not reliable, if I just scroll back and have a look at the, the, the point that's been made there. Um, no, you're absolutely right. People don't always like stuff, um, and it isn't always necessarily reliable either. Um, but I think what we can say there is the more that people do it, the more that people tend to like stuff on pages, you are identifying yourself in a particular subject area. And we can look at this in, in lots of different ways. There are things like scooped IT, where people are putting up the information that they are finding for others to be able to make use of. Uh, we need to be a beacon when it comes to search in as many different environments as we can be. But if you're looking for privacy solutions when it comes to search, you've got uh, two or three that I've already um, mentioned. Um, but there are others, Startpage, XQuick, which is basically the same search engine. Uh, another fairly new one, a thing called Motherpipe, that will find stuff for you without tracking you. There's also another really nice thing called Disconnect Private Search, which you can download or you can use it online. Um, there's Tor as a browser, which is an acronym for the Unwin Router. Um, it's free software to enable online anonymity. Um, it does mean that you can search privately. Now, I'm not really that bothered about searching privately, but when it comes to searching, what I want to be able to do is to search and not have what I've searched for previously being tracked, so that I'm always getting results based on the actual search that I've done, not what the search engine assumes it is that I want to find. Um, uh, another quick one there, um, Lightbeam, um, it's an add-on for um, browsers, particularly Firefox, uh, and it displays third-party tracking cookies that are based on a user's, uh, on a user's computer. Um, if you're interested, I'd suggest get a hold of a copy um, of it. Um, you can click on, a, on um, Lightbeam, whatever website you're on, and then you'll get to see just how much you are being tracked. It's a bit scary. Again, going back to the very first question that was asked of me, Walt, um, at the beginning of the hour, um, why can't you rely on Google? Um, because Google doesn't find stuff. Um, you could just delete the history cache, Jenny, but it's not the same thing. It is somewhat different. Google does, for example, to create a profile of you and the kind of things that you're interested in. I cannot overemphasize enough how much we are all being tracked on the net these days. So um, this is a great one when people say, oh, you know, you can find it. It's, it's all on the internet. Um, it absolutely isn't. And certainly if you want to use a graph, you know, something like this is going to be a good way of showing that, no, it's not all available to you on Google. Um, yeah, I remember Miss Dewey. Um, she didn't last for, for, for very long. Um, Again, you know, one of the things that you find when you play around with um, search over a period of time, um, the number of search engines that appear on the scene, and they're on the scene for a while, and then they just disappear again. Um, some of the really early holdouts, um, things like good old AltaVista, finally um, died a while ago. Um, great shame to see that going. 
um, Yahoo's directory, uh, one of the oldest um, bits of archaeology that we had um, when it comes to internet search. That's being closed now. Um, it's, a, it's a real shame. Back to other alternatives. Um, social media search engines are somewhere that I would suggest that you really do need to spend um, a lot more of your time these days when you're looking for the information that you need. I'm not going to go through all of these simply because I don't have the time and if you're interested um, you can have a look at them. Um, yeah, Demos um, Open Directory project, um, Juliana, is just about the only one that's, that's still there in that traditional format. Um, what you're also finding as well is that you've got clustering search engines, things like Clusty that are out there, that try to do something vaguely similar. On the social media search engine side, um, lots of these, I would recommend all of them. It's worth um, exploring them. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming out for Twitter at the moment. So, um, Twitter, top left-hand corner, for example, um, claims that they're a quick, smart Twitter search. Um, it's an interesting search engine. Um, it really is designed to follow the tweets of individuals rather than Twitter as a whole, but it, it does pull up a mine of information once you've found the person that you're interested in. Again, there's this emphasis on who is the individual, how much can I trust the individual, um, and this will tell you, for example, how many times they've tweeted, what they've done, what they're... Um, Twitter history is, and so on. It will also tell you what their top shared sites are, and so on. Um, so if you're interested in finding out about people, um, Gwitter is a good place to go. Um, Bank Tweets is a um, Twitter time machine that enables you to search through a tweet history for tweets that link back to your site, for example. <coughs> um, BuzzSumo um, is another fun one. That's a little tiny one there that's um, in the, the middle. Um, it's a new social media search engine with an interesting twist. It focuses on the top content that's available in your area of interest. Um, it makes it easy for you to find the most shared content across multiple social networks, Facebook shares, LinkedIn shares, Twitter, Pinterest, Google+, and so on. And you can filter by um, type article infographic, um, guest posts and by time. So it's a really nice, powerful um, little resource that you can use there. Uh, another one that you might be unfamiliar with, a thing called Junoba. It's a search engine that allows you to combine traditional website searches with tweets. Again, I think one of the things that we're going to be looking at into the near future of search is the role and the importance of real-time results from something like Twitter. We now need to think, well, what does new mean? A few years ago, new meant was, um, what new meant was what happened yesterday, um, or what happened on the evening uh, news, or what happened recently on your blog. Uh, what new now means is what happened in the last five or ten seconds, what's being said about it on something like Twitter. So, places to go for material like that. One of the things that I find interesting here is that, again, a lot of the social media um, search engines do tend to focus firstly on the platform, obviously, but then secondly on the importance of the individual. And this is, again, something that's really coming out a lot these days. Um, if you're interested in image search engines, sure, you can use Google, and Google does have, to be fair, uh, a very good image search functionality to it, but there are plenty of other places that um, you can go if you're looking for image uh, uh, um, images. Um, Pinterest, Flickr, the obvious two examples. Um, TinEye, which will allow you to upload an image, might be worthwhile having a look at, and it will then go off and search based on what it can see that you've, um, that you've got. Um, Vintage Ad Browser is great if you want to see over 100,000 vintage um, adverts going back to the early 1800s. Um, some of them are, they will just take your um, breath away. Um, if you're interested in um, things for teenagers, for example, you might want to find science fiction covers. Um, Cover browser, really nice example of that. If you're looking for material where you have to be sure of the provenance and 
where you can say, yes, this is in the public domain, uh, the Wikimedia Commons website search engine is a really good place to, to go. Uh, looking at new search engines, um, the one place that I say, if you want news, go to Silo Breaker. It's by far and away the best search engine uh, that I've found. It has a global um, effect on it. It's, it's looking at stuff wherever it comes. You're getting material coming up um, on a very regular basis. Um, you can look at the story. You can click on the link. You can see the details. Um, then will come out as a dialog box for you. The other thing I like about Silo Breaker, I've edited this around a little bit, um, but on the right hand side you do get to see a really nice little menu of things that are in focus at the moment, or what's happening in a network, what's available in audio or visual, um, what's available as far as press releases are concerned, or um, blogs. So new search engines, um, if you've only got one opportunity, go to Silo Breaker. Newsmap is another really fun way of working. The way that this one works is you can choose a country. Um, you can choose what your interests are. The um, colors indicate different subject areas. Um, so you'll get um, things like red will be what's happening in the world today, green will be technology issues and so on. Um, the bigger the box, the more uh, news there is about it. The different shades indicate how old it is. Um, so Newsmap is a great visual approach to take. 10 by 10 basically does what it says on the tin. You get 10 by 10, um, lots of images. You'll see over on the right hand side, um, what subjects are being um, discussed at the moment. You can click on any of those. You'll get to see what um, the subject is. Click, bang, you go through to get some information on that. Uh, news Museum, uh, again, is a really nice um, tool. Basically, what it does is it gives you um, 800 or so news front pages. It um, doesn't give you much other than that, but again, it can be a really interesting place to go and have a look at. One thing that I like is search by similar. If you can find a search engine that a bigger button, if you can find a URL, a website that does what you want, what all of these will do for you is find similar sites. It's a bit like related to, which is one of the Google functions which they're trying to hide off um, in advanced search functionality. But find um, a website. Um, Click it into similar search, um, site search, similar pages, and so on. And you'll get some examples coming back of other similar sites that you've got. Uh, alternative 2 is another nice one. Um, you can put in something like iPad or iPhone, and it will come up with alternatives for you. Uh, the one at the bottom, Taste Kid, this is a really interesting one, uh, which allows you, as it says there, type in your favorite bands, movies, and so on. Type in what you're interested in. And then you can say, OK, if you are interested in Lady Gaga, you might be interested in this movie or this book or this author and so on. So it's a really nice, fun one to go and have a look at. Um, the slides are not on SlideShare yet, but I will put them on slideshare.net slash Phil Bradley to answer Graham's question. Um, and they will be available um, on the library um, 2014. And I think if Steve can, he can put up details on um, how you can get access to the whole collection. Um, Silo Breaker isn't free. Um, what Silo Breaker will do for you um, is if you go to news.silobreaker, um, you get access to the news functionality that way. Um, sorry, Steve, I think I interrupted you. No, I don't think I did. Okay, I shall carry on. Um, so, search by similar, uh, really nice tool. Um, people search, I just have not ever found a good people search engine at all. Um, I find them that are great for one country, but they're not good globally. I find something fantastic in the United States, but it's no good for the UK or vice versa. I, quite why we've never had a really good people search engine, I don't know, but there isn't, so I shall move on. Um, we'll start wrapping up now. Um, a few specialist search engines, if you... Um, haven't tried um, these, I'll point a few of them um, out to you. Lanyard.com is great as a social conference directory. If you want to find out what conferences are taking place, see people's presentations. Um, 
or find experts in an area, lanyard.com, great place to go. Million Short is an oddity because what it can do is you can run your search and then get the top million results cut out for you. And so what you then will find is that um, you will get lots of stuff that you would otherwise never find. Um, if you don't want to cut the first million, you can just cut the first um, thousand, or I think the first hundred, or the first ten thousand, stuff like that. Um, you've got the Wayback Machine. If you've not discovered the Wayback Machine, I would very strongly recommend having a look at it because that will give you access to um, billions of web pages. It says there's uh, 435 billion web pages saved over a period of time. And so you can go back and see what a website looked like three, four, five, ten years ago. Um, absolutely, Julian, I, I love it. It's a great one. Um, case sensitive search, it's a tiny little search engine. doesn't do an awful lot, but it does prove that you can do case sensitive searching, which people like Google um, try to run away from screaming because they really don't like the concept there. A Wolfram Alpha, great. It's not a search engine. It's a computational knowledge engine. So if you need to know facts and figures about Jupiter, Wolfram Alpha is the place to go. Um, Banana Slug, if you've not seen that, again, if you just want to have a bit of fun and try something different, you can run your search and Banana Slug will then add in fairly random um, other terms for you to give you um, sort of like serendipitous search results. Um, looking at the mobile world, um, this is now where we're, we're heading, sort of looking at a few things in the future. This is what we're, we're now doing is that we don't use um, our um, traditional resources. We're using our smartphones much more these days. So we've got a fundamental change in use. Search is now coming to us. We are using our um, mobiles to get the information for us. Um, we've got things like Google Notes, so that when I start Google, up comes the little notes telling me where I am, um, telling me what the football score is that I'm interested in. And um, it's an app world. If I need to know something, I'm not going to the search engine. Why would I bother to do that? I will go and find an app, and I will do that. Um, or um, what I'll also do um, is I'll go on to Siri, and I just say to Siri, you know, what is it that I need to know? So we've got to put people like Apple into the search mix as well, which is a non-traditional um, area of search, but it's, again, something that we're going to need to consider in the future. Um, looking at new search engines, uh, again, um, I won't bother to go into a great deal of detail on all of these. You'll be able to play with them for yourself. Um, but I will just um, throw out a few of them. Um, Binpad is a, that's the one right in the middle. Um, it's a new search engine. Um, it's a category search engine based, so it will mean that you can search for it and it will on the fly pull up information and categorize it for you. So a search for Jack Russell, for example, brings back the top 50 sites for the dog, information on the breed, a search in the puppies for sale, rescue animals, and so on. Um, Leap It is a, um, Visual search engine, pop in a search term and it produces results in a magazine format type style um, with images. Um, so that's quite a, a fun one to play with. Um, Slidey, if you want to search for slides, again, it does that sort of stuff. Um, CNive is for searching for those six second vines, which are quite fun to have a look at as well. But what's the real future of search? And this is really what I'd like to um, finish on for the last three or four minutes that I've got available before I hand it over to you. Um, we've got this um, fight between Google and Facebook. As I said, Google is, has the traditional, we're emphasizing the importance of um, the website. Facebook is, is, is indicating the importance of the individual, as are a lot of the social media resources that are available for us. Search is going to be increasingly portable. If I go into a uh, art gallery, for example, and I want to know more about a, um, a piece of art that I see on the wall, I can pull up Google Goggles, which is different to um, 
uh, Google Glass. Google Goggles is is um, an uh, an, uh, an augmented reality resource that I can use. Hold it up to the um, picture that I'm interested in, and Google Goggles will come back and say, right, this is the title of this piece. This is who um, painted it. These are the things that you might want to know about it. So search is becoming where I am. It's becoming all around me. Um, we need to think about augmented reality so I can increasingly just hold my smartphone or my tablet up against something like a, a logo for a, a company and get the information that I need that way. We're going to find that um, search is much more integrated into the Internet of Things in the future. Um, I could wax lyrical about why you are actually going to want to have your toaster linked into the net and the importance of it, but again, I'm going to leave that to another day. Search is becoming increasingly personalised, but what I'm also very worried about, and I think we all need to be concerned about that, is that it's increasingly controlled by conglomerates. Going back to the whole Google and the right to be forgotten, um, what uh, the European Court of Justice has basically said to Google is, it's your job, it's your responsibility to decide what people can legally see and what they can't do. And I don't think that that's a really good way for um, us to regard search engines. Um, search, absolutely, Melissa, it's going to be very non-verbal. You're not going to need to search for stuff. Your mobile um, phone will know where you are. It will know what you're interested in. It will say, OK, you like this band, so um, it's playing tonight. Do you want me to book tickets for you? Uh, your friend is staying in the same city. Do you want to connect with your friend? Um, search will be um, appropriate for when we go into a particular room. We've got things like Chromecast at the moment. So you can have a meeting and your information professional can just be throwing information up onto the wall for you to, to have a look at. So search is increasingly not going to exist in the way that we've had it. And I think the real future of search um, is that search won't exist. Search is going to be integral into pretty much everything that we're going to be doing in the future. And we're going to get that from the smart device that we've got, whether it's the tablet, whether it's the smartphone, or increasingly, whether it's the um, wearable that we're using, the Apple Watch or any of the other um, watches that are available out there, they are going to be telling us what it is that we need to be looking at. So I think we're into a, a really interesting future with search, and I see the real battle between Google and Facebook, between privacy and having stuff um, made much more easy for you. I see a real difference between the old traditional content as uh, emphasized by websites and the new created content by the individuals that are going to be available out there. I see a real clamor for um, a fight between government and between conglomerates as to who controls the access to the information that we've got. And we are right at the heart of that. Um, we are the people that need to be able to go out to our communities and to talk about search with them. Because they're not interested in search, I get that, they're interested in finding, but what they need to be interested in is the control over the information that's being um, pushed through to them, um, the importance of them as the individual. We need to be going to those conversations. We need to be on Facebook. We need to be on Twitter and in all of the other social media um, places because what we're doing with our likes and our Google Plus ones and the things that we're tweeting and retweeting, that is affecting the search results that the rest of us are getting. On Twitter, I follow 2,000 librarians, and that's an incredibly useful resource for me because I can just see what it is that they want to know about, and I can then go to tools like Zite or Flipboard or the Tweeted Times or Paper.li or Scoop.it and see what those people are saying and what it is that they're talking about because I will rely more on the skills and the abilities of information professionals than I will do on traditional Google. Because what Google wants to do is make money, plain and simple. That's not really the kind of game I think that the rest of us are involved with. So thank you very much for your time. Um, those are plenty of different ways you can get access to um, the kind of stuff that I've got available to me. 
um, if I don't answer your question now, do feel free to contact me in any of those approaches. Um, do feel free to um, Google me, but make sure that you don't send your query to the baseball star. And please don't send your query through to the gay porn star, because you probably won't get a very good answer from them. Um, thank you very much. Um, looking at some of the questions that have been um, asked. Uh, yeah, I do have a Google Plus account. Um, I do find it useful because I use Google Plus for community-based information. There's a great group of librarians on there. Again, it's the individuals that I'm interested in, not the traditional websites that's, that's available there. Um, so I, I find that a particularly helpful resource. Um, will students use it critically? I, I suspect not. Um, it's one of the jobs and the roles that we have um, got to really push them towards. You and I all know that um, you know you can't trust Google. Hopefully, I've given you some examples of stuff there that's um, going to give you some ideas as well. Um, Steve, you've got your hand up. I think is there a question I, that you've got? That you'd like to I actually have a question for you. So the American Library Association has a pretty strong statement about privacy that goes beyond sort of the idea of, of search results shaping, but more to the health of a society, a democratic society. And the recent Pew study on silence being the result of everything being public, um, how do you feel about the, the necessity of privacy from the standpoint of intellectual inquiry? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I've given up on the whole concept of privacy, quite frankly. I, I, if I say anything, if I write anything, if I'm out on the street, I know that I can be um, quoted, I can be filmed, stuff can be put up on the net. Even if I don't want to have anything to do with the net, it's still going to be there. Um, I occasionally have people who, who um, will say quite smugly, oh, I'm not on Facebook. Actually, you probably are, because um, Facebook, although they deny it, it's not difficult for Facebook to have ghost accounts for people so that they know what is going on there. Um, people will have increasingly a payoff between um, ease and convenience of use and giving up on privacy. Um, if you are worried about privacy, then get rid of your store loyalty cards, because you know, that's, that's the biggest leak of your privacy going. Just think about the information that um, is known about you that way. Um, as far as intellectual um, inquiry goes, um, I think that we are seeing a different change now. What we had previously was a lot of um, information was limited because we had to go through um, publishers to get access to the data that we wanted. Now people can put their information up much more easily and freely. But I think what we've got to do, that we're teaching the next generation, is um, the balance between keeping their privacy and making information available for all of us. And I don't think there's a really good answer to that yet. And I don't think we're going to get one, to be honest. Um, anything else, or is that... Well, we kind of have to wrap up because we have episode. sessions that start in two minutes. Absolutely. I'm clapping for you. I'm hovering over the smiley face, and then I go down to the applause. I wish that were easier to find, but unfortunately it's not. That was brilliant. Uh, those of you who would like to, we'll leave the room open, and you can go up to File, Save, and save the whiteboard as a PDF, uh, in addition to finding it on Phil's uh, many sites. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we do have sessions starting. We want to give you at least a couple of minutes to stretch and take a break. For terrific sessions coming up, please go to library20.com, look at the schedule, and click right in. Hope you're having a great day. I am. Bye now. <laughs>